<laughs> Good morning. Welcome to Calvary Chapel Inland Devo 30. We're having fun over here. A good friend of mine. I'm Pastor Ruben. Thank you for joining us today. We stream. What kind of faces is she making? She rolled her eyes. <laughs> we stream live on Facebook every Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays. And if you're in the neighborhood, come on by and join us at 5383 Martin Street. And by the way, we are meeting tonight for Bible study. And we're in the book of Numbers. We'll be in chapters 1 and 2. We're going to go through two books, two chapters in that book. So if you'd like to join us here. Today we are in the book of 2 Corinthians. And we are in chapter 8. So if you want to grab your Bible, highlighter, pen, and get ready to study the Word of God. Let's pray. <laughs> Gracious Father, we thank you for bringing us here this morning, Lord, and we just pray your word would go out without any hindrance, Father. And Lord, it would be sound doctrine that is being taught, the simplicity of the gospel message, Lord. I pray, Lord, as we are traveling, in a sense, Lord, and this road trip through Second Corinthians, Father, that you would just throw at us some great golden nuggets, Father, that we would learn and just receive from your Holy Spirit as he ministers and teaches us, Father, about your work in our lives, Father, and about the work and kingdom of God here on earth, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Good morning again. I know there's a few of you that might be on or may not be, but we are in 2 Corinthians, and we are in chapter 8. Chapter 8 and chapter 9 deal with giving. It's one of those chapters that talk about supporting the work of the Lord. Again, it's just not more evidence that there was churches, there were churches in the early days, um, buildings where people met, uh, and they needed support to continue to run. Why do they need support? Uh, because they were reaching people with the gospel message. Now, in Jerusalem, there was a great famine, and the brothers and sisters in Christ, uh, is that door open? What's her name? It's coming in. Brothers and sisters in Christ uh, <clears throat> were in need of food and supplies uh, because of the famine, and so it was a way of providing for them the body of Christ. I love that. That's what we should be doing is providing for one another's needs through our offerings and through our giving. And it is a great example to be a, a witness to those around us too. So, so let's go ahead and, and get into chapter 8 as he talks about uh, giving as Christian believers. So starting in verse, in verse 1 of chapter 8, it says, Moreover, so moreover is kind of like therefore, but he's kind of adding, adding to, to chapter 8. He says, Brethren, we make known to you the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Mesodania. Now, just, not just one church, but there were churches in Mesodania. Uh, churches like uh, Philippi, Thessalonica, Bereans, uh, northern Greece in that area there, and south uh, with Achaia. And these were various churches that were planted there, either by Paul or others, uh, that um, that had the grace of God going on in their church. And he goes on, that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded in the riches of their liberty. For I bear witness that according to their ability, yes, and beyond their ability, they were fee freely willing, imploring us with much urgency that we would receive the gift and the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. And so he's kind of commending uh, this church. Uh, he's commending them for their willingness to give of their own resources, which isn't a whole lot. Uh, and they even went beyond, you know, uh, their giving. Um, it's kind of nice. Every once in a while I'm told that, that there's a few pennies in the in our tithe that someone had given a dollar, you know, or 50 cents. And sometimes the kids will do that. They, they give a couple of cents, you know, from their hearts. And that's always neat to see someone learning that principle. Uh, but it's really neat to see that when somebody who doesn't have a whole lot 
are faithful with what they have and they're giving it unto the Lord. And that's what these churches were doing uh, because Paul had requested that uh, from them to help their brothers. And, but just their willingness, their willingness. How do we know if we're willing uh, to support and to give? How do we know if we're willing? Because you're doing it. It's just that simple. Because you give, all my money. Because you give your money. That's exactly it. There's, there's no other way. How do I know if I'm not willing? You're not giving. Uh, you're making excuses. You're rationalizing, uh, you know, all of it. So in this study, we'll take questions afterwards, okay? So, but I know you, the questions are going to be really good. So I'll answer them when we get done. So, so, so he, he is encouraging and <coughs> commending them for their willingness to give <clears throat> because of the urgency and the ministering to uh, the saints there with their gift. Now, verse 5 says, And this they did, not as we had hoped, but first gave themselves to the Lord, and then to us by the will of God. Uh, that's always true. You cannot give yourself to anybody else unless you've given yourself to the Lord first, by the way. Unless you're, you are being fed by the vine, you cannot feed others. It will be very difficult for you to do. It will be very hard. You will struggle in the flesh with it. You have to be sitting at the feet of Jesus. And this is why Jesus spent three and a half years with his disciples, pouring into them, preparing them, equipping them, showing them his power, showing him his authority, convincing them that he was the Messiah, that he was God in the flesh. I mean, they learned so much in that three years of walking with Jesus. That was the time of pouring in. That was the time of sitting with the Lord. They had given themselves to the Lord Jesus Christ for those three years in every way and aspect. There were points of stress, you know, where Jesus would say things like, unless you eat my body, drink my blood, you can have no part of me. And they're scratching their head. And, and 120 of them scratched their head and said, this, this guy it's too much. It's too much. We're leaving and they're out of here. And Jesus turns to the 12 and especially to Peter and says, Peter, are you going too? You know, and that's the stress point at that moment. God is challenging Peter. Where are you at in your mind and in your heart? Where, where are your doubts? What are you thinking on this whole subject of me being the Messiah? Are you ready to go and book it too, like everybody else? And Peter was able to reason in his own head and say, Lord, there's no one that I have ever spoken to in this world that has convinced me they had some words of eternal life, that they understood heaven and what it took to be in heaven, that they could explain to me who God the Father was in the ways that you have. You're the only one that has the words of eternal life. Where am I going to go? At least he recognized that, that he was in a place at that time of safety and of security in his life because it was Jesus who had all the answers. He knew that, where the others doubted Jesus Christ. And unless you're in that place with the Lord constantly, it would be very difficult for you to serve others. Well, they, they definitely served uh, the Lord first, and then they uh, served one another in the grace of God. <clears throat> so we urge Titus, that as he had begun, so we would also complete this grace in you as well. But as you abound in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all diligence, and in your love for us, see that you abound in this grace also. So we see a pattern of growth there, right? Growth. We should be growing. How do we grow? Reading the Bible, prayer, fellowship. Those are the fundamental things that, that we should be in. But in that growth, we see it, their faith growing, their speech growing, their knowledge growing, and their diligence to love is growing. That should be constant in our lives as believers. We should constantly be growing uh, in those areas. Our faith should be growing. We should be trusting God more today than we did last year. Our faith should be stronger, and it should be continually growing. And when there's areas where we're lacking faith, we know that we can go to Him and say, Lord, help our unbelief. And know he's going to give us the faith. So our faith must be growing. Our speech. Our speech is growing. We no longer speak as a common person. You know? There, there, there is a language of the world. And the language includes a lot of uh, exploitations. What's that word? Explo exploitations? Exploitations? Curse words. <laughs> a lot of me words. A lot of I words, a lot of I deserve this, and I'm better than that, and I'm 
here to get this and that, but our speech should be growing in that we're like praising the Lord. And when things happen, we go, praise the Lord. I don't like it, but praise the Lord. God is good. Are you going to church today? Your speech changes. And people realize that your, cheat, your speech has changed. The knowledge that you have now, the biblical knowledge that you gain from reading your word changes. The diligence of love, learning to love people, learning to love those that aren't really easy to love. You know, that is always growing. And by the way, that continues to grow. It doesn't stop. You don't get to a place and go, all right, there, I'm arrived. No, you haven't arrived. There's, there's still, still a lot to go. So he goes on in verse 8, I speak not by commandment, but I am testing the sincerity of your love by the diligence of others. Wow, that's a test. Testing our love by the diligence of others. Are we going to match that? Match giving, right? Somebody has donated a million dollars and he's going to match if you give. No, we should be encouraging one another in our giving. When we see people giving, it should stir up in us to give uh, also. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that through he, through he, though he was rich, yet for our sake became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. And well, how was Jesus rich? He wasn't rich on the earth, as some faith teachers might say. They say, oh no, Jesus had mansions. Yeah, they were in heaven, they weren't on earth. Jesus is the creator of heaven and earth. He's rich in that area, left all his glory, all his wealth in eternity. He came down to earth and became poor for us. Kind of the opposite of what the faith teachers teach, right? Have you ever noticed that? There's actually stories in the Bible that teach the opposite of what faith teachers teach. Faith teachers teach, if you give, God's going to give you greater. God wants you wealthy. He wants you healthy. You need to name it. And if you name it and blab it, you can grab it and it's all yours because God wants you wealthy. And yet Jesus goes to this rich man and says, give it all away. Yeah. Give it all away because wealth isn't going to get you there. Only Jesus Christ will get you there. So think about that, those of you that believe that God wants us rich. Consider those things. Verse 10, <clears throat> and in this I gave my advice. It is to your advantage not only to be doing what uh, you began and were desiring to do a year ago, but now you also must complete the doing of it, that as there was a readiness to desire it, so that so there also <clears throat> may be a completion uh, out of what you have. For if there is first a willing mind, it is accepted according to what one has and not according to what he does not have. For I do not mean that others should be erased uh, and you burden, eased or new burden, but by an equality that now at this time your abundance may, be, may supply their lack, that their abundance also may supply your lack, that there may be uh, equality. As it is written, he who gathers much has nothing left over, and he who gathers little has no lack. Uh, but thanks be to God who puts uh, the same earnest care for you into the, hearts, into the heart of Titus. For he not only accepted the exhortation, but being more diligent, he went to you of his own accord. And we have sent with him the brother uh, whose praise is in the gospel throughout all the churches. And not only that, but who was also chosen by the churches to travel with us with this gift, which is administered by us to the glory of the Lord himself and to show your ready mind. Avoiding this, that anyone should blame us in this lavish gift, which is administered by us. So they were uh, kind of collecting uh, the giving from the different churches. And some churches were being very uh, generous and others were only giving what they could give, but he was grateful for all of it. And then he was gonna send it to Jerusalem. And verse 22, oh, verse 21, providing honorable things, not only in the sight of the Lord, but also in the sight of men. And we have sent with them our brother whom we have often 
proved diligent in many things, but now much more diligent because of the great confidence of which we have in you. If anyone inquires about Titus, he is my partner and fellow worker concerning you. Or if our brethren are inquired about, they are messengers. The word messengers means sent one or apostles, but not in the sense of uh, the apostles, the 12. So they're basically messengers of the churches, uh, the glory of Christ. Therefore, show to them and before the churches the proof of your love and of your boasting on our behalf. So the point here is that <clears throat> that Paul is making is that there's this love connection that has been made because of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ has touched their hearts so deeply and changed them that they all of a sudden have this love for one another. And Jesus made it very clear that if you want to know that you're a disciple of God or want others to know that you're a disciple of God, they're going to know it by this, by the love you have one for another. So the way that we treat one another, the way that we respect and love one another, it is evidence of our love for God, that we are his disciples, that he has called us by his grace to be his disciples. That is the gospel message, isn't it? Amen. That is the gospel message. See, what is the gospel? In John chapter 3, Jesus had a visit by Nicodemus. Nicodemus came at night and he had all kinds of questions as a religious leader. All kinds of questions. I'm sure theological questions. Might have been from the Old Testament. Who knows? Uh, maybe he wanted to hear it straight from him. Are you the Messiah? Because here are all the requirements of the Messiahship. And I want to know exactly if you are the Messiah. And Jesus didn't say any of that. It doesn't matter, Nick. What matters is, are you born again? That's what he said. You must be born again in order to enter the kingdom of God. In other words, something has to happen in your life that changes you. Something so drastic, something so clear that your mindset snaps to, to understand the gospel message. That you are so willing to respond to the grace of God that it begins to change you <clears throat> from the inside out. Not immediately, at times it can be, but not immediately. That born-again experience, which is not flesh and blood it is a spiritual thing understand this it is not a flesh and blood thing you cannot change yourself you have to pray to god to change you you have to receive jesus christ into your heart you have to beg him to come into your heart to reside in there to be your savior to be your everything what Jesus was saying, Nick, you must be born again. You must receive me as the Messiah. I will give you the Holy Spirit and he will cause you to be born again, Nick. You will see things that you've never seen. Your questions will be answered in time because you'll be a new creature. Paul puts it this way. For those who are in Christ Jesus are new creatures. We're new creatures. The old things pass away. Behold, new things are coming. That's the growth that we just read there. Our speech changes. Our knowledge increases. You know, our faith grows. That's the process of being born again that is taking place. And so he tell Nick, you must be born again. And it's born again of the Spirit of God, not the flesh, but the Spirit of God. The Spirit has to enter into you. You must receive Him. You must ask for Him. <clears throat> Holy Spirit, come into me. Come into me and fill me. Guide me. Lead me. Comfort me, Holy Spirit that I may change from the inside out. I can't change myself. I can't change myself. And Nicodemus was blown away by that. He was blown away by that, that here I am, a religious man with all this knowledge and understanding, and yet I have to be born again. He even said, what are you talking about? Do I have to go back into my mother's womb? Now, that's an educated man. I mean, come on, how can you go back into your mother's womb? You can't. So obviously Jesus is talking about something spiritual taking place in our lives, that it changes us drastically. That's the gospel message that Jesus came to bring to us. And Paul said in Romans 10, 9, that if you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. If you confess it with your mouth that Jesus resurrected from the dead, you'll be saved. 
You see, what happens is when your heart is changed, when you believe it in your heart, your words change. You begin to profess different things. Your life changes from your old nature to a new nature. God literally causes you to be born again. It's like you become someone so different that when people see you, who were your past friends or relatives or workmates, whatever, they see you, they look at you and they say, what happened to you? Where's that person I knew? You're different. You know, first of all, you're always talking about Jesus now. But even not just that. I remember you used to have a sailor's mouth. And now you don't have a sailor's mouth anymore. What's going on with that? And you're like, I don't know. It just kind of stopped. You know, I'm giving in to the Holy Spirit. You're changing where people see the noticeable change. Now, <clears throat> when you're born... Obviously, nobody knows what you look like because you're in your mother's womb, right? We don't know. It's a boy. Okay, great. It's a boy. Well, what is, it's got to have hair. We know that. And a nose and eyes and ears. We know the fundamental parts of them, but <clears throat> going to look more like the mom or is it going to look more like the dad? Or is it going to kind of look like both of them? You know, who's darker skin, lighter skin, you know? What's it look like? We don't know. We don't know. And then all of a sudden when it's born, then you go, oh, okay. Yeah, it is your kid. I can see the resemblance there. <laughs> You know, that's your child. Look at all that hair or, wow, there's no hair. What happened there? You know, I mean, you start to see this person and you now are connected and you're making this, creating this relationship with this infant, the mama, the daddy, the, the brothers and sisters, if they're sisters or whoever's around are creating this relationship. And now they're seeing this person, they're getting to know this person. This person is growing up and maturing, you know, from babies, sucking on their mother's breasts for milk, to bottles, to walking, to chewing, to eating, to, you know, clothing themselves. And, and all of a sudden they get to an age and they receive Jesus Christ and things change again. And you go, wait a minute, I knew you before, but now you're different. What happened? Jesus Christ came into my life. And there's a joy in my life. There's a hunger for godly things, not just a hunger for a good marriage, not just a hunger for a good job, not just a hunger for life, you know, and the pleasures of it, but a hunger for God. There's a hunger for God. And that hunger is so deeply in you that it longs to know more about God and experience God. That's what being born again is. And if you're not born again, you need to be born again, the Bible says, in order to enter the kingdom of God. If you haven't been changed, as Paul said, a new creature, you need to be born again. Otherwise, you cannot inherit the kingdom of God. What does that mean, not inherit the kingdom of God? That means when you stand before God and you're not born again, God's going to say, depart from me. I don't know you. But wait a minute. I would tell people all the time, I believe in God. Yeah, but you never had that changed experience. Your heart hasn't been changed you're not born again. You're still that old same person. You just have a head knowledge of God. That's all. And there are plenty of people with head knowledges of God. The religious leaders had the head knowledge of God, right? And Jesus said, you vipers, you know, you den of vipers and a, you know, a, a little viper is a little snake. Uh, they're infant. They're more poisonous than an adult because they don't know when to stop and they pour their whole venom into you. But he called them whitewashed sepulchers. That means your graves, your graves, inside you are graves. And yet they knew God. They knew Moses and the forefathers. They knew what God did in the burning bush. They knew all those things, but they didn't know God. There's a, a sense of knowing who God is and wanting to know more of him. And if you're not that, then you'd be separated from God. And there's a place that God is going to judge you. It is called the, beam, the, the great white throne judgment. And in that place, God will look at you and he will judge you by your works. And then at that point, he will send you to hell, Gehenna, where the worm doesn't die and the fire is not quenched. That is the gospel message. That is the gospel message. And the only way that you can cure that is by receiving Jesus Christ into your heart and by asking the Holy Spirit to fill you and giving you a new life. Let's pray. And I hope some of you will pray this. Lord Jesus, come into my life. Be my savior. Lord, I have been trying in my own strength and power to be as good as I can. I've been trying, Lord, to find rest and peace in my own strength, but I can't, Lord. It only has to come from knowing you, Jesus. And so I give my heart to you, Lord. Would you please take it? I don't know what that looks like. I don't know how to do that. I'm just believing by faith that you will do that, Lord. 
and you will begin to work in my heart, Lord. Give me the Holy Spirit, and Lord, seal me so that I am born again, and I become that new creature in Christ Jesus, Lord. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. We're going to take some time here and pray. If you'd like some prayer, please uh, post it there or private message me, and we will pray for you. I hope that you made that prayer. If you did, please let us know. It would be nice to see a post on the Facebook there saying, I've received Jesus Christ into my heart. That would be a blessing to me. God bless you. Have a wonderful day. In Jesus' name.